The man-eating leopard of Rudraprayang. Epoch 7. Locating the leopard. Man-eating leopards are of rare occurrence, and for this reason very little is known about them. My own experience of these animals was very limited, amounting to no more than a brief encounter with one many years previously, and though I suspected that the changeover from animal to human and animal diet would affect the habits of a leopard as much as it does those of a tiger, I did not know to what extent a leopard's habits would change, and meanwhile I decided to try to kill the man-eater by the methods usually employed for killing leopards. The most common method of killing leopards is to sit up for them, either over a kill or over live bait in the form of a goat or a sheep. To carry out either one of these methods it is necessary in the one case to find a kill, and in the other to locate the quarry. My object in going to Rudraprayag was to try to prevent further loss of human life, and I had no intention of waiting for another human kill to occur over which I could sit, therefore the obvious thing to do was to locate the man-eater and shoot it over live bait. Here a formidable difficulty, which I hoped in time partly to overcome, presented itself. From the maps I had been supplied with I found that the man-eater was operating over an area of roughly 500 square miles. 500 square miles of country anywhere would have been a considerable area in which to find and shoot any animal, and in this mountainous and rugged part of Garwal the task of finding an animal that only operated at night appeared, at first glance, to be well nigh impossible, until I took the Alanander River, which divided the area into two more or less equal parts, into consideration. It was generally believed that the Alanander offered no obstacle to the man-eater and that when he found it difficult to obtain a human kill on one bank, he crossed over to the other bank, by swimming the river. I discounted this belief. No leopard in my opinion would under any circumstances voluntarily commit itself to the swift-flowing, ice-cold waters of the Alanander, and I was convinced that when the man-eater crossed from one bank to the other he did so by one of the suspension bridges. There were two suspension bridges in the area, one at Rudraprayag, and the other about 12 miles farther up the river, at Chatwapipal. Between these two bridges there was a swing bridge, the one by which Ibbotson, his party, and the 200 men had crossed the river on the day of the beat. This swing bridge, which no animal excepting a rat could possibly have crossed, was the most fear-compelling structure of its kind that I have ever seen. The two hand-twisted grass cables, blackened by age and moldy from the mists rising from the river, spanned some 200 feet of foaming white water which, a hundred yards farther down, surged with a roar like thunder between two walls of rock, where a kaka, driven by wild dogs, is credited with having leapt across the Alanander. Between the cables, and forming the footway, were odd bits of sticks an inch and a half to two inches in diameter set about two feet apart and loosely tied to the cables with wisps of grass. To add to the difficulty in crossing this cobweb structure, one of the cables had sagged with the result that the sticks on which one had to place one's feet were at an angle of 45 degrees. The first time I met this fearsome jeweler I was foolish enough to ask the toll collector, who for the payment of one pice permitted me to risk my life on it, whether the bridge was ever tested or repaired. His answer, given as he ran a speculative eye over me, that the bridge was never tested or repaired but was replaced when it broke under the weight of someone who was trying to cross it, gave me a cold feeling down my spine, a feeling that remained with me long after I had got safely to the other side. This jeweler being beyond the powers of the man-eater to cross, there remained the two suspension bridges, and I felt sure that if I could close them against the leopard I should be able to confine him to one side of the Alanander, and so reduce by half the area in which to look for him. The first thing therefore was to try to find out on which bank of the river the leopard was. The last kill, of the sadhu, had taken place on the left bank of the river a few miles from the Chatwapipal suspension bridge, and I felt sure that the leopard had crossed this bridge, after abandoning his kill, for no matter what precautions the locals and the pilgrims may have taken before a kill, their precautions were redoubled immediately after one, and made it almost impossible for the leopard to secure consecutive kills in the same area. Looking at the map you will ask why, if this was so, as many as six kills have been shown against a single village. I can only answer that an effort cannot be sustained indefinitely. The houses are small and without conveniences or means of sanitation, and it would not be surprising if, hearing the man-eater was operating in a village 10, 15, or 20 miles away, some man, woman, or child should, at the urgent dictate of nature, open a door for a brief minute and so give the leopard the chance for which he had perhaps been waiting many nights. Epoch 8. The Second Kill. No photographs or other means by which I could identify the man-eater by his pug marks were available, so, 
Until I had been given an opportunity of acquiring this information for myself, I decided to treat all leopards in the vicinity of Rudraprayag as suspect, and to shoot any that gave me a chance. The day I arrived at Rudraprayag, I purchased two goats. One of these I tied up the following evening a mile along the pilgrim road, the other I took across the Alanander and tied up on a path running through some heavy scrub jungle where I found the old pug marks of a big male leopard. Upon visiting the goats the following morning I found the one across the river had been killed and a small portion of it eaten. The goat had unquestionably been killed by a leopard, but had been eaten by a small animal, possibly a pine marten. Having received on news about the man-eater during the day, I decided to sit up over the goat, and at 3 p.m. took up my position in the branches of a small tree about 50 yards from the kill. During the three hours I sat in the tree I had no indication, from either animals or birds, that the leopard was anywhere in the vicinity, and as dusk was falling I slipped off the tree, cut the cord tethering the goat, which the leopard had made no attempt to break the previous night, and set off for the bungalow. I have already admitted that I had very little previous experience of man-eating leopards, but I had met a few man-eating tigers, and from the time I left the tree until I reached the bungalow I took every precaution to guard against a sudden attack, and it was fortunate that I did so. I made an early start next morning, and near the gate of the bungalow I picked up the tracks of a big male leopard. These tracks I followed back to a densely wooded ravine which crossed the path close to where the goat was lying. The goat had not been touched during the night. The leopard that had followed me could only have been the man-eater, and for the rest of the day I walked as many miles as my legs would carry me, telling all the people in the villages I visited, and all whom I met on the roads, that the man-eater was on our side of the river, and warning them to be careful. Nothing happened that day, but next day, just as I was finishing breakfast after a long morning spent in prospecting the jungles beyond Golabri, a very agitated oh, man dashed into oh. the bungalow to tell me that a woman had been killed by the man-eater the previous night in a village on the hill above the bungalow, the same hill and almost at the exact spot from where you obtained your bird's eye view of the 500 square miles of country the man-eater was operating over. Within a few minutes I collected all the things I needed, a spare rifle and a shotgun, cartridges, rope, and a length of fishing line, and set off up the steep hill accompanied by the villager and two of my men. It was a sultry day, and though the distance was not great, three miles at the most, the climb of 4,000 feet in the hot sun was very trying and I arrived at the village in a bath of sweat. The story of the husband of the woman who had been killed was soon told. After their evening meal, which had been eaten by the light of the fire, the woman collected the metal pots and pans that had been used and carried them to the door to wash, while the man sat down to have a smoke. Upon reaching the door the woman sat down on the doorstep, and as she did so the utensils clattered to the ground. There was not sufficient light for the man to see what had happened, and when he received no answer to his urgent call he dashed forward and shut and barred the door. Of what use, he said, would it have been for me to risk my life in trying to recover a dead body? His logic was sound, though heartless, and I gathered that the grief he showed was occasioned not so much by the loss of his wife, as by the loss of that son and heir whom he had expected to see born within the next few days. The door, where the woman had been seized, opened onto a four-foot wide lane that ran for fifty yards between two rows of houses. On hearing the clatter of the falling pots and pans, followed by the urgent call of the man to his wife, every door in the lane had been instantaneously shut. The marks on the ground showed that the leopard had dragged the unfortunate woman the length of the lane, then killed her, and carried her down the hill for a hundred yards into a small ravine that bordered some terraced fields. Here he ate his meal, and here he left the pitiful remains. The body lay in the ravine at one end of a narrow terraced field, at the other end of which, forty yards away, was a leafless and stunted walnut tree in whose branches a hayrick had been built, four feet from the ground and six feet tall. In this hayrick I decided to sit. Starting from near the body, a narrow path ran down into the ravine. On this path were the pug marks of the leopard that had killed the woman, and they were identical with the pug marks of the leopard that had followed me two nights previously from the killed goat to the Rudraprayag bungalow. The pug marks were of an outsized male leopard long past his prime, with a slight defect where a bullet fired four years previously had creased the pad of his left hind paw. I procured two stout eight-foot bamboos from the village and drove them into the ground close to the perpendicular bank that divided the field where the body was laying from the field below. To these bamboos I fixed my spare rifle and shotgun securely, tied lengths of dressed silk fishing line to the triggers, 
loop the lines back over the trigger guards, and fasten them to two stakes driven into the hillside on the far side of, and a little above, the path. If the leopard came along the path he had used the previous night there was a reasonable chance of his pulling on the lines and shooting himself. On the other hand, if he avoided them, or came by any other way, and I fired at him while he was on the kill, he would be almost certain to run into the trap which lay on his most natural line of retreat. Both the leopard, because of its protective coloring, and the body, which had been stripped of all clothing, would be invisible in the dark, so to give me an idea of the direction in which to fire, I took a slab of white rock from the ravine and put it on the edge of the field, about a foot from the near side of the body. My ground arrangements completed to my satisfaction, I made myself a comfortable seat on the rick, throwing out some of the straw, and heaping some behind me and up to my waist in front. As I was facing the kill and had my back to the tree, there was little chance of the leopard seeing me, no matter at what time he came, and that he would come during the night, in spite of his reputation of not returning to his kills, I was firmly convinced. My clothes were still wet after the stiff climb, but a comparatively dry jacket kept out the chill wind, so I settled down into my soft and comfortable seat and prepared for an all-night vigil. I sent my men away, and told them to remain in the headman's house until I came for them, or until the sun was well up next morning. I had stepped from the bank onto the rick and there was nothing to prevent the Manita from doing the same. The sun was near setting, and the view of the Ganges Valley, with the snowy Himalayas in the background showing bluish pink under the level rays of the setting sun, was a feast for the eyes. Almost before I realized it, daylight had faded out of the sky and night had come. Darkness, when used in connection with night, is a relative term and has no fixed standard. What to one man would be pitch dark, to another would be dark, and to a third moderately dark. To me, having spent so much of my life in the open, the night is never dark, unless the sky is overcast with heavy clouds. I do not wish to imply that I can see as well by night as by day, but I can see quite well enough to find my way through any jungle or, for that matter, over any ground. I had placed the white stone near the body only as a precaution, for I hoped that the starlight, with the added reflection from the snowy range, would give me sufficient light to shoot by. But my luck was out, for night had hardly fallen when there was a flash of lightning, followed by distant thunder, and in a few minutes the sky was heavily overcast. Just as the first big drops of a deluge began to fall, I heard a stone roll into the ravine, and a minute later the loose straw on the ground below me was being scratched up. The leopard had arrived, and while I sat in torrential rain with the icy cold wind whistling through my wet clothes, he lay dry and snug in the straw below. The storm was one of the worst I have ever experienced, and while it was at its height, I saw a lantern being carried towards the village, and marveled at the courage of the man who carried it. It was not until some hours later that I learned that the man who so gallantly braved both the leopard and the storm had done a forced march of over 30 miles from Powery to bring me the electric night shooting light the government had promised me, the arrival of this light three short hours earlier might. But regrets are vain, and who can say that the 14 people who died later would have had a longer span of life if the leopard had not buried his teeth in their throats. And again, even if the light had arrived in time there is no certainty that I should have killed the leopard that night. The rain was soon over, leaving me chilled to the bone, and the clouds were breaking up when the white stone was suddenly obscured, and a little later I heard the leopard eating. The night before, he had lain in the ravine and eaten from that side, so, expecting him to do the same this night, I had placed the stone on the near side of the kill. Obviously, the rain had formed little pools in the ravine, and to avoid them the leopard had taken up a new position and in doing so had obscured my mark. This was something I had not foreseen, however, knowing the habits of leopards, I knew I should not have to wait long before the stone showed up again. Ten minutes later the stone was visible, and almost immediately thereafter I heard a sound below me and saw the leopard as a light yellowish object disappearing under the rick. His light color could be accounted for by old age, but the sound he made when walking I could not then, nor can I now, account for, it was like the soft rustle of a woman's silk dress, and could not be explained by stubble in the field, for there was none, or by the loose straw lying about. Waiting a suitable length of time, I raised the rifle and covered the stone, intending to fire the moment it was again obscured, but there is a limit to the time a heavy rifle can be held to the shoulder, and when the limit had been reached I lowered the rifle to ease my aching muscles. I had hardly done so when the stone for the second time disappeared from view. 
Three times within the next two hours the same thing happened, and in desperation, as I heard the leopard approaching the rick for the fourth time, I leant over and fired at the indistinct object below me. The narrow terrace to which I have given the usual name of, field, was only about two feet wide at this point, and when I examined the ground next morning, found my bullet hole in the center of the two foot wide space with a little hair, cut from the leopard's neck, scattered round it. I saw no more of the leopard that night, and at sunrise I collected my men and set off down the steep hill to Rudraprayag, whilst the husband and his friends carried away the woman's remains for cremation. Epoch 9. Preparations. My thoughts as, cold and stiff, I walked down the hill to Rudraprayag from the scene of my night's failure were very bitter, for, from whatever angle it was viewed, there was no question that the fickle jade chance had played both Garwal and myself a scurvy trick which we did not deserve. However little I merit it, the people of our hills credit me with supernatural powers where man-eaters are concerned. News that I was on my way to try to rid Garwal of the man-eater had preceded me, and while I was still many days march from Rudraprayag the men I met on the roads, and those who from their fields or village homes saw me passing, greeted me with a faith in the accomplishment of my mission that was as touching as it was embarrassing, and which increased in intensity the nearer I approached my destination. Had any been there to witness my entry into Rudraprayag, he would have found it hard to believe that the man whom the populace thronged round was no hero returning from the wars, but a man, very sensible of his limitations, who greatly feared that the task he had undertaken was beyond his powers of accomplishment. 500 square miles, much of which was clothed with dense scrub jungle, and all of which was rugged and mountainous, was an enormous area in which to find and shoot one particular leopard out of possibly 50 that inhabited it, and the more I saw of the grand and beautiful country the less I liked it from the viewpoint of the task I had undertaken. The populace quite naturally did not share my misgivings, to them I was one who had rid others of man-eaters and who had now come among them to rid them of the menace they had lived under for eight long years. And then, with incredible good luck, I had within a few hours of my arrival got the animal I was in pursuit of to kill one of my goats and, by staying out a little after dark, to follow me to that side of the Alanander where I believed it would be less difficult to deal with it than it would have been on the other side. Following on this initial success had been the kill of the unfortunate woman. I had tried to prevent the further loss of human life, and had failed, and my failure had presented me with an opportunity of shooting the leopard which otherwise I might not have got for many months. As I had been toiling uphill behind my guide the previous day, I had weighed up my chances of killing the leopard and assessed them at two to one, despite the facts that the animal had in recent years earned the reputation of never returning to a kill, that it was a dark night, and that I had no aid to night shooting. The day I visited Michael Keane and told him I would go to Garwal he had asked me if I had everything I wanted, and hearing that I only lacked a night shooting light and would telegraph to Calcutta for one, he said the least the government could do for me was to provide me with a light, and he promised to have the best one procurable waiting for me at Rudraprayag. Though my disappointment was great when I found that the light had not arrived, it was mitigated by my ability to see in the dark, the ability on which I had assessed my chances at two to one. So much depended on the success of that night's venture, that I had armed myself with a spare rifle and shotgun, and when from my concealed position on the hayrick I viewed the scene, the short range at which I should get my shot, and the perfectly camouflaged gun trap into which the leopard would of a certainty run if I missed or wounded him, my hopes rose high and I put my chances of success at 10 tune. Then had come the storm. With visibility reduced to practically nil, and without the electric light, I had failed, and my failure would in a few hours be known throughout the stricken area. Exercise, warm water, and food have a wonderfully soothing effect on bitter thoughts, and by the time I had picked my way down the steep hillside, had a hot bath, and breakfast, I had ceased to rail at fate and was able to take a more reasonable view of my night's failure. Regret over a bullet fired into the ground was as profitless as regret over milk spilt on sand, and provided the leopard had not crossed the alanander my chances of killing it had improved, for I now had the electric shooting light which the runner had braved both the leopard and the storm to bring me. The first thing to do was to find out if the leopard had crossed the alanander, and as I was firm in my conviction that the only way it could do this was by way of the suspension bridges, I set out after breakfast to glean this information. I discounted the possibility of the leopard having crossed the Chatwapipal bridge, for no matter how great the shock he had received by the discharge of my heavy rifle a few feet from his head, 
It was not possible that he would have covered the 14 miles that separated the kill from the bridge in the few hours that remained between the firing of my shot and daylight, so I decided to confine my search to the Rudraprayag bridge. There were three approaches to the bridge. One from the north, one from the south, and between these two a well-beaten footpath from the Rudraprayag Bazaar. After examining these approaches very carefully I crossed the bridge and examined the Kadarnath Pilgrim Road for half a mile, and then the footpath on which three nights previously my goat had been killed. Satisfied that the leopard had not crossed the river, I determined to put in operation my plan for closing the two bridges at night and thus confining the leopard to my side of the river. The plan was a simple one and, given the cooperation of the caretakers of the bridges, both of whom lived on the left bank and close to the bridge abutments, was certain of success. To close the only means of communication between the two banks of the river over a stretch of some 30 miles would appear to be a very high-handed proceeding, but actually it was not so, for no human being dared to use the bridges between sunset and sunrise owing to the curfew imposed by the leopard. The bridges were closed by wedging thornbushes in the four-foot-wide archway in the towers carrying the steel cables from which the plank footway was suspended, and during the whole period that the bridges were closed with thorn, or were guarded by me, no human being demanded passage across them. I spent in all some twenty nights on the tower on the left bank of the Rudraprayag bridge, and those nights will never be forgotten. The tower was built out on a projecting rock and was twenty feet high, and the platform on the top of it, which had been worn smooth by the wind, was about four feet wide and eight feet long. There were two means of reaching this platform, one by swarming along the cables, which ran through holes near the top of the tower and were anchored in the hillside some fifty feet from the tower, and the other by climbing up a very rickety bamboo ladder. I chose the latter way, for the cables were coated over with some black and very evil-smelling matter which clung to one's hands and permanently stained one's clothes. The ladder, two uneven lengths of bamboo connected with thin sticks loosely held in position with string, only reached to within four feet of the platform. Standing on the top rung of the ladder and dependent for a handhold on the friction of the palms of my hands on the smooth masonry, the safe gaining of the platform was an acrobatic feat that had less appeal the oftener it was tried. All the rivers in this part of the Himalayas flow from north to south, and in the valleys through which they flow blows a wind which changes direction with the rising and the setting of the sun. During daylight hours the wind, locally called Dadu, blows from the south, and during the hours of night it blows from the north. At the time when I used to take up my position on the platform, there was usually a lull in the wind, but shortly thereafter it started blowing as a light zephyr gaining in strength as daylight faded, and amounting by midnight to a raging gale. There was no handhold on the platform and even when lying flat on my stomach to increase friction and reduce wind pressure, there was imminent risk of being blown off onto the rocks 60 feet below, off which one would have bounced into the ice-cold Alignander, not that the temperature of the water would have been of any interest after a fall of 60 feet onto sharp and jagged rocks. Strangely enough, whenever I felt in fear of falling it was always the water, and never the rocks, that I thought of. Added to the discomfort of the wind, I suffered torment from a multitude of small ants, which entered my clothes and ate away patches of skin. During the twenty nights I guarded the bridge, the thorn bushes were not placed in position, and in all that long period the bridge was only crossed by one living thing, a jackal. Epoch 10. Magic. Each evening when I went to the bridge I was accompanied by two men who carried the ladder that enabled me to climb to the platform, and which they removed after handing me my rifle. On the second day, as we arrived at the bridge, we saw a man dressed in flowing white robes with something glinting on his head and breast. He carried a six-foot silver cross, and was approaching the bridge from the direction of Kadarnath. On reaching the bridge the man knelt down and, holding the cross in front of him, bowed his head. After remaining in this position for a little while he raised the cross high, rose to his feet, took a few steps forward, and again knelt down and bowed his head. This he continued to do at short intervals all the way across the long bridge. As he passed me the man raised his hand in salutation, but since he appeared to be deep in prayer I did not speak to him. The glints I had seen on his headdress and breast were, I perceived, silver crosses. My men had been as interested in this strange apparition as I had been, and watching him climb the steep footpath to the Rudraprayag Bazaar, they asked me what manner of man he was, and from what country he had come. That he was a Christian was apparent, and as I had not heard him speak I assumed from his long hair, jet black luxuriant beard, 
and what I could see of his features, that he was a man from northern India. The following morning, when with the help of the ladder I had climbed down from the tower and was proceeding to the inspection bungalow, where I passed that portion of the daylight hours that I did not spend in visiting near and distant villages in search of news of the man-eater, I saw the tall white-robed figure standing on a great slab of rock near the road, surveying the river. At my approach he left the rock and greeted me, and when I asked him what had brought him to these parts he said he had come, from a distant land, to free the people of Garwal from the evil spirit that was tormenting them. When I asked how he proposed accomplishing this feat, he said he would make an effigy of a tiger and after he had, by prayer, induced the evil spirit to enter it, he would set the effigy afloat on the Ganges and the river would convey it down to the sea from where it could not return, and where it would do no farther harm to human beings. However much I doubted the man's ability to accomplish the task he had set himself, I could not help admiring his faith and his industry. He arrived each morning before I left the tower, and I found him still at work when I returned in the evening, laboring with split bamboos, string, paper, and cheap colored cloth on his tiger. When the effigy was nearing completion a heavy rainstorm one night made the whole structure come unstuck, but, nothing daunted, he cheerfully started on it again next morning, singing as he worked. Came at last the great day when the tiger, about the size of a horse, and resembling no known animal, was fashioned to his satisfaction. Who is there among our hill folk who does not wholeheartedly enjoy taking part in a tamasha? When the effigy, tied to a long pole, was carried down a steep path to a small sandy beach, it had an escort of over a hundred men, many of whom were beating gongs and blowing long trumpets. At the river's edge the effigy was unlashed from the pole. The white-robed man, with his silver crosses on headgear and breast and his six-foot cross in his hands, knelt on the sand, and with earnest prayer induced the evil spirit to enter his handiwork, and then the effigy, with a crash of gongs and blare of trumpets, was consigned to the Ganges, and speeded on its way to the sea by a liberal offering of sweets and flowers. Next morning the familiar figure was absent from the rock, and when I asked some men who were on their way to have an early dip in the river where my friend of the flowing robes had come from, and where he had gone, they answered, who can tell whence a holy man has come, and who dare question whither he has departed. These men with sandalwood paste cast marks on their foreheads, who spoke of the man as holy, and all those others who had taken part in the launching ceremony, were Hindus. In India, where there are no passports or identity discs, and where religion counts for so much, except among those few who have crossed the black water, I believe that a man wearing a saffron robe, or carrying a beggar's bowl, or with silver crosses on his headgear and chest, could walk from the Khyber Pass to Cape Comoran without once being questioned about his destination, or the object of his journey. Epoch 11. A Near Escape. While I was still guarding the bridge, Ibbotson and his wife Jean arrived from Powery, and as the accommodation in the inspection bungalow was very limited I moved out to make room for them, and set up my 40-pound tent on the hill on the far side of the Pilgrim Road. A tent afforded little protection against an animal that had left his claw marks on every door and window for miles round, so I helped my men to put a thorn fence round the ground we intended to camp on. Overhanging this plot of ground was a giant prickly pear tree, and as its branches interfered with the erection of the tent I told the men to cut it down. When the tree had been partly cut through I changed my mind, for I saw that I should be without shade during the heat of the day, so instead of felling the tree I told the men to lop the overhanging branches. This tree, which was leaning over the camp at an angle of 45 degrees, was on the far side of the fence. There were eight of us in the little camp, and when we had eaten our evening meal I wedged a thornbush securely into the opening in the fence we had entered by, and as I did so I noticed that it would be very easy for the man-eater to climb the tree and drop down on our side of the fence. However, it was too late then to do anything about it, and if the leopard left us alone for that one night, the tree could be cut down and removed in the morning. I had no tents for my men, and had intended that they should sleep with Ibbotson's men in the outbuildings of the inspection bungalow, but this they had refused to do, asserting that there was no more danger for them than there was for me in the open tent. My cook, who was, I discovered, a very noisy sleeper, was lying next to and about a yard from me, and beyond him, packed like sardines in the little enclosure, were the six gawalis I had brought from Nainital. The weak spot in our defense was the tree, and I went to sleep thinking of it. It was a brilliant moonlit night, and round about midnight I was suddenly awakened by hearing the leopard climbing the tree. Picking up the riffle, which was lying ready loaded on the bed, 
I swung my legs off the bed and had just slipped my feet into my slippers, to avoid the thorns which were scattered all round, when there was an ominous crack from the partly cut through tree, followed by a yell from the cook of Barg. Barg! In one jump I was outside the tent and, swinging round, was just too late to get the rifle to bear on the leopard as it sprang up the bank onto a terraced field. Pulling the bush out of the gap I dashed up to the field which was about 40 yards in width and bare of crops, and as I stood scanning the hillside dotted over with thorn bushes and a few big rocks, the alarm call of a jackal far up the hill informed me that the leopard had gone beyond my reach. The cook informed me later that he had been lying on his back, a fact of which I had long been aware, and hearing the tree crack he had opened his eyes and looked straight into the leopard's face just as it was preparing to jump down. The tree was cut down next day and the fence strengthened, and though we stayed in that camp for several weeks our slumbers were not again disturbed. Epoch 12. The Jin Trap. From reports received from nearby villages where unsuccessful attempts had been made to break into houses, and from the pug marks I had seen on the roads, I knew that the man-eater was still in the vicinity and a few days after the arrival of the Ibbotsons, news was brought that a cow had been killed in a village two miles from Rudrapriyag, and about half a mile from the village where I had sat on the hayrick in a walnut tree. Arrived at the village we found that a leopard had broken down the door of a one-roomed house and had killed and dragged to the door one of the several cows that were in it, and not being able to drag it through the door, had left it on the threshold after eating a good meal. The house was in the heart of the village, and on prospecting round, we found that by making a hole in the wall of a house a few yards away we could overlook the kill. The owner of this house, who was also the owner of the dead cow, was only too willing to fall in with our plans, and as evening closed in we locked ourselves very securely into the room, and after eating our sandwiches and drinking the tea we had brought with us, we mounted guard in turns over the hole in the wall throughout the long night without either seeing or hearing anything of the leopard. When we emerged in the morning the villagers took us round the village, which was of considerable size, and showed us the claw marks on doors and windows made by the man-eater in the course of years, in his attempts to get at the inmates. One door in particular had more and deeper claw marks than any other, it was the door the leopard had forced to enter the room in which the forty goats and the boy had been secured. A day or two later another cow was reported to have been killed in a small village on the hill a few hundred yards from the bungalow. Here again we found that the cow had been killed inside a house, dragged as far as the door, and partly eaten. Facing the door, and distant from it about ten yards, was a newly built hayrick, 16 feet tall and built on a wooden platform two feet above ground. News of the kill was brought to us early in the morning, so we had the whole day before us, and the macken we built by evening was I am sure not only the most effective, but also the most artistic, that has ever been constructed for a similar purpose. To start with, the rick was dismantled, and a scaffolding of poles was set round the platform. With these poles to support it, a second, and smaller, platform was built four feet above the lower one. Two-inch mesh wire netting was then wound round the whole structure, leaving only the space bare between the lower platform and the ground. Wisps of straw were then looped into the meshes of the netting, and a little straw was spread round the rick and under the platform, just as it had been before we started work. One of the joint owners of the hayrick, who had been absent from the village for a day or two and who returned just as we had finished our task, would not believe that the rick had been disturbed until he felt it all round, and had been shown the second rick we had built with the spare hay in an adjoining field. As the sun was setting we crawled through the hole we had left in and entered the macken, securely closing the entrance behind us. Ibbotson is a little shorter than me, so he took the upper platform, and when we had made ourselves comfortable we each made a small hole in the straw to shoot through. As it would not be possible for us to communicate with each other once the leopard arrived, we agreed that whoever saw it first was to fire. It was a bright moonlit night, so there was no need for either of us to use the electric light. Sounds in the village quietened down after the evening meal had been eaten, and at about 10 pm I heard the leopard coming down the hill behind us. On arriving at the rick it paused for a few minutes and then started to crawl under the platform I was sitting on. Immediately below me, and with only the thickness of a plank between my seat and his head, he paused for a long minute and then started to crawl forward, and just as I was expecting him to emerge from under the platform and give me an easy shot at a range of three or four feet, there was a loud creak in the platform above me. The leopard dashed out to the right, where I could not see him, and went up the hill. 
The creaking of the planks at the critical moment had resulted from Ibbotson changing his position to relieve a very painful cramp in both legs. After the fright he had got, the leopard abandoned the kill and did not return that night, or the next night. Two nights later another cow was killed a few hundred yards above the Rudraprayag Bazaar. The owner of this cow lived alone in an isolated house, which contained only one room, a room which was divided by a rough partition made of odd bits of plank into a kitchen and living room. Sometime during the night a noise in the kitchen, the door of which he had forgotten to shut, awakened the man, and a little later, in the dim moonlight which the open door was admitting, he saw the leopard through the wide chinks in the partition, trying to tear one of the planks out. For a long time the man lay and sweated, while the leopard tried plank after plank. Eventually, being unable to find a weak place in the partition, the leopard left the kitchen and killed the man's cow, which was tethered in a grass lean to against the side of the house. After killing the cow, the leopard broke the rope by which it was tethered, dragged it a short distance from the lean-to, and left it out in the open after partaking of a good meal. On the very edge of the hill, and about 20 yards from where the dead cow was lying, there was a fair-sized tree, in the upper branches of which a hayrick had been built, on this natural macken, from which there was a sheer drop of several hundred feet into the valley below, Ibbotson and I decided to sit. To assist in killing the man-eater, the government a few days previously had sent us a gin trap. This trap, which was five feet long and weighed 80 pounds, was the most fearsome thing of its kind I have ever seen. Its jaws, armed with sharp teeth three inches long, had a spread of 24 inches, and were actuated by two powerful springs, which needed two men to compress. When leaving the kill the leopard had followed a footpath across a field about 40 yards wide, up a three-foot bank, and across another field bordered by a densely scrub-covered hill. At this three-foot step from the upper to the lower field, we set the trap, and to ensure the leopard stepping onto it we planted a few thorn twigs on either side of the path. To one of the trap was attached a short length of half-inch thick chain, terminating in a ring three inches in diameter. Through this ring we drove a stout peg, chaining the trap to the ground. When these arrangements had been completed, Jean Ibbotson returned to the bungalow with our men, and Ibbotson and I climbed up to the hayrick. After tying a stick in front of us and looping a little hay over it, to act as a screen, we made ourselves comfortable, and waited for the leopard, which we felt sure would not escape us on this occasion. As evening closed in heavy clouds spread over the sky, and as the moon was not due to rise until 9pm, we had of necessity to depend on the electric light for the accuracy of our shooting until then. This light was a heavy and cumbersome affair, and as Ibbotson insisted on my taking the shot, I attached it to my rifle with some little difficulty. An hour after dark a succession of angry roars apprised us of the fact that the leopard was in the trap. Switching on the electric light, I saw the leopard rearing up with the trap dangling from his forelegs, and taking a hurried shot, my 450 bullet struck a link in the chain and severed it. Freed from the peg the leopard went along the field in a series of great leaps, carrying the trap in front of him, followed up by the bullet from my left barrel, and two lethal bullets from Ibbotson's shotgun, all of which missed him. In trying to reload my rifle I displaced some part of the light, after which it refused to function. Hearing the roars of the leopard and our four shots, the people in Rudraprayad Bazaar, and in nearby villages, swarmed out of their houses carrying lanterns and pine torches, and converged from all sides on the isolated house. Shouting to them to keep clear was of no avail, for they were making so much noise that they could not hear us. So while I climbed down the tree, taking my rifle with me, a hazardous proceeding in the dark, Ibbotson lit and pumped up the petrol lamp we had taken into the Macken with us. Letting the lamp down to me on the end of a length of rope, Ibbotson joined me on the ground, and together we went in the direction the leopard had taken. Halfway along the field there was a hump caused by an outcrop of rock. This hump we approached, with Ibbotson holding the heavy lamp high above his head, while I walked by his side with rifle to shoulder. Beyond the hump was a little depression, and crouching down in this depression and facing us and growling, was the leopard. Within a few minutes of my bullet crashing into his head, we were surrounded by an excited crowd, who literally danced with joy round their long-dreaded enemy. The animal that lay dead before me was an outsized male leopard, who the previous night had tried to tear down a partition to get at a human being, and who had been shot in an area in which dozens of human beings had been killed, all good and sufficient reasons for assuming that he was the man-eater. But I could not make myself believe that he was the same animal I had seen the night I sat over the body of the woman. True, 
It had been a dark night and I had only vaguely seen the outline of the leopard. Even so, I was convinced that the animal that was now being lashed to a pole by willing hands was not the man-eater. With the Ibbotsons leading the way, followed by the men carrying the leopard and a crowd of several hundred men, we set off via the bazaar for the bungalow. As I stumbled down the hill in the wake of the procession, the only one in all the throng who did not believe that the man-eating leopard of Rudraprayag was dead, my thoughts went back to an occurrence that had taken place not far from our winter home when I was a small boy, and which I saw recounted many years later in a book entitled Brave Deeds, or perhaps it was Bravest Deeds. The occurrence concerned two men, Smeaton of the Indian Civil Service and Braidwood of the Forest Department. One dark stormy night, in pre-railway days, these two men were traveling in a dark G. Harry from Muradabad to Kaladungi, and on going round a bend in the road they ran into a rogue elephant. In killing the driver and the two horses, the elephant overturned the G. Harry. Braidwood had a rifle, and while he got it out of its case, put it together, and loaded it, Smeaton climbed onto the G. Harry and released the one unbroken lamp from its socket. Then Smeaton, holding the oil lamp which only gave a glimmer of light over his head, advanced up to the elephant and shone the light on his forehead, to enable Braidwood to get in a killing shot. Admittedly there was a great difference between a rogue elephant and a leopard. Even so, there are few who would care to walk up to a pain-maddened leopard, which we later found had practically torn its paw free and was only held by a thin strip of skin, holding a lamp above his head and depending for safety on a companion's bullet. For the first night in many years every house in the bazaar was open, with women and children standing in the doorways. Progress was slow, for every few yards the leopard was put down to let the children cluster round and get a better view of it. At the farther end of the long street our escort left us, and the leopard was carried in triumph to the bungalow by our men. Returning to the bungalow after a wash at my camp, the Ibbotsons and I, both during and long after it, put forward our arguments for and against the dead leopard being the man-eater. Eventually, without either side convincing the other, we decided that as Ibbotson had to get back to his work at Powery, and I was tired out after my long stay at Rudraprayag, we would spend the next day in skinning the leopard and drying the skin, and on the day after would break camp and make for Powery. From early morning to late evening relays of men kept coming in from near and distant villages to see the leopard, and as most of these men asserted that they recognized the animal as the man-eater, the conviction of the Ibbotsons, that they were right and I was wrong, grew. Two concessions at my request Ibbotson made, he added his warning to the people to mind, not to relax precautions against the man-eater, and he refrained from telegraphing to tell the government that we had shot the man-eater. We went early to bed that night, for we were to start at daybreak next morning. I was up while it was still dark and was having Chota Hazri when I heard voices on the road. As this was very unusual, I called out to ask what men were doing on the road at that hour. On seeing me, four men climbed up the path to my camp, and informed me they had been sent by the Patwari to tell me that a woman had been killed by the man-eater on the far side of the river, about a mile from the Chatwapapal bridge. Epoch 13. The hunters hunted. Ibbotson was just unbolting the door to admit his man with early tea when I arrived, and after he had countermanded his move to Powery we sat on Jean's bed with a large-scale map between us, drinking tea and discussing our plans. Ibbotson's work at his headquarters at Powery was pressing, and at most he could only spare two more days and nights. I had telegraphed to Naini Tal the previous day to say I was returning home via Powery and Kotdwara. This telegram I decided to cancel, and instead of going by rail, I would return on foot the way I had come. These details settled, and the village where the woman had been killed found on the map, I returned to camp to tell my men of our change of plans, and to instruct him to pack up and follow us, accompanied by the four men who had brought news of the kill. Jean was to remain at Rudraprayag, so after breakfast Ibbotson and I set off on two of his horses, a Gulf Arab and an English mare, two of the most sure-footed animals I have ever had the good fortune to ride. We took our rifles, a blue flame stove, a petrol lamp, and some provisions with us, and were accompanied by one of Ibbotson's sizes on a borrowed horse, carrying food for our horses. We left the horses at the Chatwapapal bridge. This bridge had not been closed the night we shot the leopard, with the result that the man-eater had got across the river and secured a kill at the first village he visited. A guide was waiting for us at the bridge, and he took us up a very steep ridge and along a grassy hillside and then down into a deep and densely wooded ravine with a small stream flowing through it. Here we found the Patwari and some twenty men guarding the kill. 
The kill was a very robust and fair girl, some 18 or 20 years of age. She was lying on her face with her hands by her sides. Every vestige of clothing had been stripped from her, and she had been licked by the leopard from the soles of her feet to her neck, in which were four great teeth marks. Only a few pounds of flesh had been eaten from the upper portion of her body, and a few pounds from the lower portion. The drums we had heard as we came up the hill were being beaten by the men who were guarding the kill, and as it was then about 2 p.m. and there was no chance of the leopard being anywhere in the vicinity, we went up to the village to brew ourselves some tea, taking the patwari and the guard with us. After tea we went and had a look at the house where the girl had been killed. It was a stone-built house, consisting of one room, situated in the midst of terraced fields some two or three acres in extent, and it was occupied by the girl, her husband, and their six-month-old child. Two days previous to the kill, the husband had gone to Powery to give evidence in a land dispute case, and had left his father in charge of the house. On the night of the kill, after the girl and her father-in-law had partaken of their evening meal and it was getting near time to retire for the night, the girl, who had been nursing her child, handed it over to her father-in-law, unlatched the door, and stepped outside to squat down. I have already mentioned that there are no sanitary conveniences in the houses of our hill folk. When the child was transferred from the mother to the grandfather, it started crying, so even if there had been any sound from outside, and I am sure there was none, he would not have heard it. It was a dark night. After waiting for a few minutes the man called to the girl, and receiving no answer he called again. Then he got up and hurriedly closed and latched the door. Rain had fallen earlier in the evening and it was easy to reconstruct the scene. Shortly after the rain had stopped, the leopard, coming from the direction of the village, had crouched down behind a rock in the field, about 30 yards to the left front of the door. Here it had lain for some time, possibly listening to the man and the girl talking. When the girl opened the door she squatted down on its right hand side, partly turning her back on the leopard, who had crept round the far side of the rock, covered the 20 yards separating him from the comer of the house with belly to ground and, creeping along close to the wall of the house, had caught the girl from behind, and dragged her to the rock. Here, when the girl was dead, or possibly when the man called out in alarm, the leopard had picked her up and, holding her high, so that no mark of hand or foot showed on the soft newly ploughed ground, had carried her across one field, down a three-foot bank, and across another field which ended in a twelve-foot drop onto a well-used footpath. Down this drop the leopard had sprung with the girl, who weighed about eleven stone, in his mouth, and some idea of his strength will be realized from the fact that when he landed on the footpath, he did not let any portion of her body come in contact with the ground. Crossing the footpath he had gone straight down the hill for half a mile, to the spot where he had undressed the girl. After eating a little of her, he had left her lying in a little glade of emerald green grass, under the shade of a tree roofed over with dense creepers. At about four o'clock we went down to sit over the kill, taking the petrol lamp and night shooting light with us. It was reasonable to assume that the leopard had heard the noise the villagers made when searching for the girl, and later when guarding the body, and that if it returned to the kill it would do so with great caution. So we decided not to sit near the kill, and selected a tree about 60 yards away on the hill overlooking the glade. This tree, a stunted oak, was growing out of the hill at almost a right angle, and after we had hidden the petrol lamp in a little hollow and covered it over with pine needles, Ibbotson took his seat in a fork of the tree from where he had a clear view of the kill, while I sat on the trunk with my back to him and facing the hill. Ibbotson was to take the shot, while I saw to our safety. As the shooting light was not functioning, possibly because the battery had faded out, our plan was to sit up as long as Ibbotson could see to shoot and then, with the help of the petrol lamp, get back to the village where we hoped to find that our men had arrived from Rudrapriyag. We had not had time to prospect the ground, but the villagers had informed us that there was heavy jungle to the east of the kill, to which they felt sure the leopard had retired when they drove it off. If the leopard came from this direction, Ibbotson would see it long before it got to the glade and would get an easy shot, for his rifle was fitted with a telescopic sight which not only made for accurate shooting, but which also gave us an extra half hour, as we had found from tests. When a minute of daylight more or less may make the difference between success and failure, this modification of the light factor is very important. The sun was setting behind the high hills to the west, and we had been in shadow for some minutes when a kaka dashed down the hill, barking, from the direction in which we had been told there was heavy jungle. On the shoulder of the hill the animal pulled up, and after barking in one spot for some time went away on the far side, 
and the sound dies away in the distance. The kaka had undoubtedly been alarmed by a leopard, and though it was quite possible that there were other leopards in that area, my hopes had been raised, and when I looked round at Ibbotson I saw that he too was keyed up, and that he had both hands on his rifle. Light was beginning to fade, but was good enough to shoot by even without the aid of the telescopic sight, when a pine cone dislodged from behind some low bushes 30 yards above us came rolling down the hill and struck the tree close to my feet. The leopard had arrived and, possibly suspecting danger, had taken a line that would enable him to prospect, from a safe place on the hill all the ground in the vicinity of his kill. Unfortunately, in so doing he had got our tree in a direct line with the kill, and though I, who was showing no outline, might escape observation, he would be certain to see Ibbotson, who was sitting in a fork of the tree. When sufficient light for me to shoot by had long since gone, and Ibbotson's telescopic sight was no longer of any use to him, we heard the leopard coming stealthily down towards the tree. It was then time to take action, so I asked Ibbotson to take my place, while I retrieved the lamp. This lamp was of German make and was called the Petromax. It gave a brilliant light, but, with its long body and longer handle, was not designed to be used as a lantern in a jungle. I am a little taller than Ibbotson, and suggested that I should carry the lamp, but Ibbotson said he could manage all right, and, moreover, that he would rather depend on my rifle than his own. So we set off, Ibbotson leading and I following with both hands on my rifle. Fifty yards from the tree, while climbing over a rock, Ibbotson slipped, the base of the lamp came in violent contact with the rock, and the mantle fell in dust to the bottom of the lamp. The streak of blue flame directed from the nozzle onto the petrol reservoir gave sufficient light for us to see where to put our feet, but the question was how long we should have even this much light. Ibbotson was of the opinion that he could carry the lamp for three minutes before it burst. Three minutes, in which to do a stiff climb of half a mile, over ground on which it was necessary to change direction every few steps to avoid huge rocks and thorn bushes, and possibly followed and actually followed as we found later, by a man-eater, was a terrifying prospect. There are events in one's life which, no matter how remote, never fade from memory. The climb up that hill in the dark was for me one of them. When we eventually reached the footpath our troubles were not ended, for the path was a series of buffalo wallows, and we did not know where our men were. Alternately slipping on wet ground and stumbling over unseen rocks, we at last came to some stone steps which took off from the path and went up to the right. Climbing these steps we found a small courtyard, on the far side of which was a door. We had heard the gurgling of a hooker as we came up the steps, so I kicked the door and shouted to the inmates to open. As no answer came, I took out a box of matches and shook it, crying that if the door was not opened in a minute I would set the thatch alight. On this an agitated voice came from inside the house, begging me not to set the house on fire, and saying that the door was being opened. A minute later first the inner door and then the outer door were opened and in two strides Ibbotson and I were in the house, slamming the inner door, and putting our backs to it. There were some twelve or fourteen men, women, and children of all ages in the room. When the men had regained their wits after the unceremonious entry, they begged us to forgive them for not having opened the doors sooner, adding that they and their families had lived so long in terror of the man-eater that their courage had gone. Not knowing what form the man-eater might take, they suspected every sound they heard at night, in their fear they had our full sympathy, for from the time Ibbotson had slipped and broken the mantle, and a few minutes later had extinguished the red-hot lamp to prevent it bursting, I had been convinced that one, and possibly both, of us would not live to reach the village. We were told that our men had arrived about sundown, and that they had been housed in a block of buildings farther along the hill. The two able-bodied men in the room offered to show us the way, but as we knew it would be murder to let them return to their homes alone, we declined their offer which had been made with the full realization of the risk it would entail, and asked if they could provide us with a light of some kind. After rummaging about in a corner of the room, an old and decrepit lantern with a cracked globe was produced, and when vigorous shaking had revealed that it contained a few drops of oil, it was lit, and with the combined good wishes of the inmates we left the house, the two doors being shut and bolted on our heels. More buffalo wallows and more sunken rocks, but with the glimmer of light to help us we made good progress and, finding the second lot of steps we had been instructed to climb, we mounted them and found ourselves in a long courtyard facing a row of double-storied buildings extending to the right and to the left, every door of which was fast shut, and not a glimmer of light showing anywhere. When we called the door was opened, 
and by climbing a short flight of stone steps we gained the veranda of the upper story, and found the two adjoining rooms which had been placed at the disposal of our men and ourselves. While the men were relieving us of the lamp and our rifles, a dog arrived from nowhere. He was just a friendly village pie, and after sniffing round our legs and wagging his tail, he went towards the steps up which we had just come. The next second, with a scream of fear followed by hysterical barking, he backed towards us with all his hair on end. The lantern we had been lent had died on us as we reached the courtyard, but our men had procured its twin brother. Though Ibbotson held it at all angles while I hurriedly reloaded my rifle, he could not get its light to illuminate the ground eight feet below. By watching the dog it was possible to follow the movements of the leopard. When the leopard had crossed the yard and gone down the steps leading to the footpath, the dog gradually stopped barking and lay down intently watching in that direction, and growling at intervals. The room that had been vacated for us had no windows, and as the only way in which we could have occupied it in safety would have been by closing the solid door, and excluding all air and light, we decided to spend the night on the veranda. The dog evidently belonged to the late occupant of the room and had been accustomed to sleeping there, for he lay contentedly at our feet and gave us a feeling of safety as we watched in turn through the long hours of the night. To be continued.